Hey guys, the next guy that's coming up is uh, a guy that would get really mad if I flattered him right now. But uh, he is a good friend of mine and a dear brother, and he uh, is going to show you some things about the authority of Scripture that will give you such confidence in, 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 in our King. It will give you such confidence tomorrow. Uh, that you've never, if you've never heard presuppositional apologetics presented and why it's important and why you shouldn't use any other method, he is the guy. He runs a ministry called Proof That God Exists.org. And he uh, actually has started doing some stuff with Crown Arts Media too. So we're going to be making some videos and stuff together, and he's come on board to help us with that. And so, but this is my good friend, Cy and Presbyterian, Cy Timber and Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, bro. Good evening. I'd like to start by reading from Romans, the first chapter, starting at verse 18 through verse 21. It's Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Hear the word of God. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Brothers and sisters, tonight we find ourselves on the eve of the Reason Rally, dubbed the largest gathering of the secular movement in history. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to be wading into those crowds. And I have one hour to teach you presuppositional apologetics. Now, for those who you don't know, apologetics is defined as a reasoned defense of your faith. It's not saying we're sorry, we're giving a reasoned, logical defense of our faith. And the term presuppositional, I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Now, I really do appreciate y'all for coming out here this evening, but I wonder if you, came, if you would come here tonight if I said, I'm going to tell you how to defend your belief that air exists. If I came here and I said, I'm going to teach you how to defend your belief that air exists, you wouldn't have come tonight. If anyone comes up to you and says, there is no air, we'd think they were a fool. And we could easily refute them. The question is, what does Scripture say about somebody who denies the existence of God. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Why would we consider somebody who denies error to be a fool, but not someone who denies God, when Scripture says that they're fools? How can we read, as we did in Romans 1 just now, that everyone knows that God exists, yet believe the unbeliever when they say they don't? How can we read in Colossians 2 that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ? Or in Proverbs 1 verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and then reason with the unbeliever as though they can know anything without God? The answer is simple. When we defend our faith, we've given up biblical authority and we pay lip service to what the Bible says. You see, I only have an hour to teach you this apologetic. But in a way, an hour is way too long. Because I can teach you this in 20 seconds. Read your Bible, believe what it says. When Scripture says that everyone knows that God exists, believe it. 
When Scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, believe it. When Scripture says that unbelievers are fools, believe it. You know what? I'd like to just stop now. Really, I'd like to stop and go home. Because I'm going to keep talking for the rest of the hour, and you're going to get confused. You're going to forget those points. The Bible teaches us how to defend the faith. All we have to do is read it, believe it, and do what it says. I could be done. But the thing is, people don't understand what the Bible is telling us. So hopefully I can help and explain things a little bit for you. You see, for some reason, we read verses like those, we say we believe them, and then we go and defend their faith, our faith as if they weren't true. See, I was teaching a friend of mine this apologetic for hours, for hours upon hours, and then he finally got it. Do you know what he said to me? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You can't know anything unless you start with God. I said, man, that's what I told you at the beginning. <laughs> he said, yeah, but now I get it. See, I'm not saying it's intentional, folks. But we've given up biblical authority when we defend our faith. Oh, biblical authority, that's fine for church. You see, in church we say, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. What do we say in the world? And I may shock some of you here tonight. What do we say in the world? Every building needs a builder. Every building needs a builder. Brothers and sisters, God is not a builder. God is not a builder. God is the builder. They know it, and they're without excuse for denying it. You see, it's not the heavens declare the glory of a builder. Now let's use your reasoning to see who that builder is. If we grant that they don't need God to reason, then what they reason to is not God. It's an idol that's subject to their reasoning rather than the king of kings who's lord of it. You see, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we're going to say that you can use your reason to examine the evidence and get to God. Folks, that is evidential apologetics. Examine the evidence so you can get to God. When the Bible says that you know that God exists, you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, and that you need God to reason about anything. You know what that kind of apologetics gets you? Anthony Flew. I don't know if you know who Anthony Flew is, but he was dubbed, uh, he was a world-renowned atheist, and they said he was the most famous, the most renowned atheist in the world. And he examined the evidence, and he became a deist. He died back in 2010, 2010. He wrote a book, There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. That was victory for the evidentialists. If you don't believe me, Google his name. Look at the interviews on YouTube all over the place. They're interviewing this man, asking what evidence came and made you believe that there was a God. And they were proud of that. They brought him out there. You know what? If Anthony flew didn't repent for his sin against the God he knows exists and put his faith in Jesus Christ, Anthony Flew is in hell. That is not victory. You see, is it any wonder that the defense of our faith is so pathetic when many of our Christians are, Christian universities are teaching us to do it the wrong way? I was looking at a promotional video for evidential apologetics. This fellow, famous evidential apologist, goes around to universities teaching people, teaching students how to defend their faith. And then at about the uh, two-minute mark, this woman came on, college-age student, and this is what she said in a promotional video for evidential apologetics. It said, it's really neat to take the Bible out of if God exists or not. It was really neat that he was able to do that. That was in a promotional video. Brothers and sisters, you can't defend Christianity by giving up Christianity. We're being taught how to defend our faith in something that's not God, but an idol that's subject to our reasoning. You see, in church we say, nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. Nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. Tears streaming down our faces. 
Oh, beautiful. That's beautiful. What comfort. What do we say in the world? You know, I could be wrong, but if I'm wrong, I die, rot in the ground, worms eat my body. If I'm right, oh boy, I get to go to heaven forever. You know, if you're right, you die, rot in the ground, worms eat your, eat your body. But if you're wrong, you have a torment, an eternal torment in the lake of fire. What have you got to lose by believing in God? Don't tell me you haven't heard that. I've heard it. Do you know where I've heard it? Coming out of my own mouth. I've said that. If I'm right, if, if I'm right, nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. You know, if you could be wrong, you can't say that. And you're not talking about the God of Scripture. You see, in church we say that God certainly exists. In the world, we argue for a probable God. Brothers and sisters, a probable God is not God. You see, the world wants you to believe in a probable God. A probable God is not offensive. A probable God only makes probable demands on your life. You're not going to offend people at work or be unwelcome at parties when you tell them that you could be wrong, when you tell them that God is not certain. Brothers and sisters, everyone knows that God certainly exists. But sigh, my 90-year-old grandma, she's so sweet, she's so kind, she's doing her knitting, you know, she's saying she doesn't know, and I think I believe her, why would she lie? What does the scripture say? Everyone knows that God exists. But let me ask you, do you pray for her? Do you share the gospel with her? Why? She doesn't know you think she have an excuse. You share the gospel with her, she can reject Christ, now she can go to hell forever? If she doesn't know, preaching the gospel would be the worst thing you could do for her. You know, we shouldn't go to these missionaries to these islands to preach the gospel to these people if they have an excuse. We should build walls around the islands. Why do we go and send missionaries? Because they're going to hell without Christ. We go there to teach them about Jesus Christ. Everyone knows that God exists. You know? People might de deny this apologetic for emotional reasons. You don't want to think of Granny going to hell. You don't want to think about that. You want to think that she has a chance without Christ. But that's not consistent with our prayers and our preaching because we want them to know Christ. That's why we do it. Now, it's not difficult. Sometimes this could be just as easy as telling the person that you know that they know that God exists. I was having dinner with a friend of mine not too long ago, and a good friend of mine. He says, Sai, the thing that I hate most about you is how certain you are that God exists. This is a friend of mine, somebody he hates about me. So how certain I am that God exists. He says, Sai, how are you so certain that God exists? Do you know what I said to him? The same way you are, and you're rejecting him. Do you know what he did? He looked at his hands, he got up from the table as if he was going to wash them. Do you know why? Because he was crying. I didn't have to use evidence with him. I confronted him with the fact that he knew that God exists. Last summer, I was out at Newport Beach doing some open-air witnessing, and this fellow came up to me on his bicycle. He was in his 50s, asked what I was doing. I said, I'm witnessing to people, telling them about Christ. And he said, you know, two of my brothers committed suicide. He said, I swore at God. I shook my fist at God. And he happened to have a, a book on Hinduism in his bicycle. And he showed it to me. It was dog-eared, underlined. He just picked it up a few days before at the dollar store. But he was reading it. And he said, I like this Hinduism. I like this Brahman, this oneness of being. I could get into Hindu Hinduism. And I said, tell me, is that the God you're mad at when your brothers committed suicide? And do you know what he did? Do you know what he said to me? Nothing. Because he was crying. Everyone knows that God exists. You see, God doesn't send people to hell for denying what they don't know, but for their sin against the God that they do know. When Scripture says that everyone knows that God exists, believe it. You know, it's obvious that the atheist is going to deny the certainty of God. But I know Christians who say they're not certain. 
Now, we're supposed to be merciful to those who doubt. After all, what do we have that we've not been given as it says in 1 Corinthians 4? But if that's the testimony of any of you here tonight, if you're not certain, I have one word for you. Repent. How many times have you heard it said that Christianity is not a religion? It's a relationship. Well, Christianity is a religion. But Christianity is a relationship. Can you imagine someone saying, I have a wonderful, loving relationship with my wife. I'm just not certain she exists. What would you think about that relationship? Now, I'm not going to say these people aren't Christians. They know that God certainly exists, but the world has duped them into professing something that's not God. But sigh, what about faith? Are we supposed to have faith? If you have certainty, you can't have faith. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Hebrews 11.1 now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's what Christian faith is. Certainty. Luke chapter 1. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of things you have been taught. John, 17, uh, John chapter 17 verse 8. Jesus praying for his disciples. I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty, certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Acts 2.36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you, whom you crucified. Scripture talks about certainty. You know, in one of my debates, my atheistic opponent said to me, there is no certainty. He said, there is no certainty. You know what I said to him? Are you certain about that? Denying certainty is self-refuting. It's foolishness. Brothers and sisters, don't give up biblical authority. When Scripture calls unbelievers fools, believe it. Brothers and sisters, unbelievers are fools. Not in the name-calling sense. Don't go around calling them fools, but it's a description of their unwillingness to reason, their willful suppression of the truth. It's a moral claim. They may be very intelligent, maybe more than some of you, probably more than me, but when they deny God, they're thinking like fools. They'll say, I don't need God for knowledge. All knowledge is gained by observation. Do you know what I say? Where did you observe that? Unbelief is foolishness. You know, I've had Christians contact me and say that before they learned how to defend the faith properly, they were afraid to watch certain atheistic YouTube videos. It frightened them. They thought it would shake in their faith. Now that they know how to defend the faith properly, biblically, they go to the same video and they're dumbfounded at the foolishness of the atheist. Now that they declare a certain God, their faith is un shakable. Was this person saved before they were certain? I don't know. What happens when a person goes from a shakable faith to an unshakable faith? I don't know. From a probable God to the certain God? I don't know what happens, but I love it when it does. That's what happens when you defend the faith biblically when you don't give up the authority of God's word. Brothers and sisters, this apologetic will help you deal with unbelievers. But this apologetic is not for them. It's for you. You know how I know when someone understands this apologetic, when they really get it? See, I've tried to teach many people how to defend their faith this way. But if they think it's a cool way to argue, or another tool in the toolbox, they don't get it. You know how, know how I know when they really get it? When it causes them to love God more. 
See, it's not a tool in the toolbox. It's the very foundation upon which the toolbox sits. When you go from exalting Christ in Lord, as Lord just in the church to exalting Him as Lord in every aspect of your life, including your apologetic, it's not a cool way to argue. It's life-changing. You see, when God commands us to defend the faith, and it is a command, He also equips us. Jesus in Luke 21, 15 said, For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Wow. When you understand that he's done that, you want to praise his name. What did Jesus say when he sent out his disciples just before what is now known as the Great Commission? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go out and make disciples of all, the nation, of all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations. What do we do? We give up his authority. Use the authority of the unbeliever to argue for his authority. You can't defend Christianity by giving up Christianity. Now, the verse most often quoted when discussing apologetics is 1 Peter 3.15. Very often, though, the most important part of the verse is either ignored or totally left out. We hear, always be prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared to give an answer. And we hear the rest of the verse. But how does that verse start? But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Why does Scripture tell us to do this with gentleness and respect? Because we're not talking about the complexity of the I. We're destroying worldviews. That's why we have to be gentle. And you know, don't be a jerk about it. Because you know what we're doing out there? We're shooting down their airplane and we're popping it full of holes. And if you're a jerk, they're not coming to you. You have to provide a safe runway for them to land on. If you are a jerk when you shut down their plane, they're ditching in Lake Hindu. They're ditching in Lake Scientology. They're not coming to you for the gospel. Don't be a jerk about it. Brothers and sisters, when we give up biblical authority to defend our faith, not only are we doing it wrong, we're engaging in an impossible task. You see, if you argue with the world on their level, you have to be as smart or smarter than the world. You have to know biology, geology, chemistry, astrophysics, quantum mechanics. Those things are great to know to study God's creation. Praise God for them. But no one could be an expert in all those fields. And you'd be arguing on the world's terms. Let's say tomorrow somebody comes up to you and wants to argue the age of the earth with you and you happen to know a lot about rock layers, or at least more than the person that challenges you, you win the argument. What's the person going to do when they get home? Google rock layers and read what Professor Van Farf and Claverman has to say about it so that he can argue with you the next time that he sees you. Scripture says that they're without excuse, and you got them to look up rock layers. Congratulations. Let's say the next person happens to be a PhD in geology and he wants to argue rock layers with you. He's going to mop the floor with you. And we're supposed to answer everyone who asks us for a reason defense of our faith. Impossible when you do it wrong. Who did God use to command us to defend the faith? Peter. What did Peter do for a living? He was a fisherman. No offense, but fishermen are not known for their intellect. If you feel that you have to be a genius to defend your faith, you're doing it wrong. How have we been de defending the truth of the Bible? Hey, Mr. Christian, how do you know that the Bible's true? Well, there are 66 books written by 40 authors over about 1,500 years. We have paper fragments dating back to the first century, fulfilled prophecy, internal consistency over the whole book. That's how I know the Bible is true. Wait a minute. 
doesn't your Bible say that a snake talked? That a man walked on water? That a man who was dead for three days came back to life? You've got evidence of a fairy tale. I couldn't care less if you had the leather-bound originals. I'm not believing that. I was talking to the atheist the other day, a scientist. He told me he just couldn't believe the Bible. You know, I didn't pull out paper fragment P66 to prove to him that the Bible was true. A paper fragment is not going to tell you that a snake talked. It's not going to prove that a snake talked. You know what I said to him when he said he couldn't believe the Bible? I said, you're right. You can't. No amount of evidence is going to get you to believe that a dead man came back to life or that a snake talked. You need to repent. You need to repent of your sin. You need to repent of denying the God you know exists. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You see, this would be nothing raising the dead, making snakes talk. That would be nothing for the creator of the universe. You can't get that until you repent of denying the creator of the universe. <laughs> I mean, sorry. You see, the problem, brothers and sisters, is we're trying to get the unbeliever to know the truth so that they'll repent. We're trying to get them to know the truth so that they'll repent. Just, you know, look at every apologetical thing out there trying to get them to see the truth with evidences so that they'll repent. What does Scripture say? 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 and 25, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Repentance comes before a knowledge of the truth, not after. It makes sense, doesn't it? How can they accept the truth of the Bible while rejecting the very source of truth? We're doing it exactly upside down. We want the person to know the truth using evidence and their reasoning so that they'll repent. When the Bible teaches us they have to repent to know the truth. That's what happens when you give up biblical authority. You mess it all up. Now I'm going to tell you a story, and for those of you who have heard it, I apologize already, but talking about giving up your authority. And I call it one cop town. And what I'd like you to do, I'd like you all to imagine that you're policemen. You're policemen in a small town. This town is so small that you're the only policeman. Every Friday night, you get a call from the local pub. Bob the drunk is drunk again. You drive to the local pub, sure enough, he's dropped down drunk. You take him, you pour him into your cruiser. You take him to the station, to your one cell jail cell to, to sleep it off overnight. You put him in the cell, and as is your custom, it's a small town, you take your cruiser home for the night. Saturday morning, you, you go back to the station to let him out. But on the way, you stop at the dry cleaner, you pick up some uniforms, you hang them in the back of your cruiser. You go to the station, Bob is sobered up, so you let him go. And as is your custom, because you do this every week, Saturday morning, you go up, you know, you're back at the station, you want to do some paperwork. So you go up to your office and you're doing some paperwork. Around noon, you decide to go home for the day. You go out to the parking lot and your cruiser is missing. But it's such a small town that you figure, oh, it's probably those Baker boys they are playing a trick on me. They're going to bring it back. You're not too worried about it. You don't call it in. How are you going to get home? Well, you have a bicycle at the station because you use it for working out. You take off your uniform, you put on your yellow spandex with your helmet with a little mirror on it. You get on your bike, you start going home down the highway. You hear a siren. You look in your little mirror, there's a cruiser coming up on you. Your cruiser. Outsteps Bob, wearing your neatly cleaned and pressed uniform, and he says, you were speeding. Okay, stop for a minute. You see the parallel? That's just like every apologetic situation. 
Here's someone who's stolen your authority and he's making an accusation against you. The question is, how do you answer? How do you answer? What do most Christians do in a situation like that? They give evidence. Well, let's see how that works with Bob. Look at the evidence, Bob. There's no way I could have been speeding. You know, I happen to know the land speed record for this type of bicycle on a flat surface with no headwind is 45 miles an hour. The speed on this highway is 55 miles an hour. Look at my legs, they're too skinny. Look at the wheels on this bicycle. Look at the gearing ratio, the handlebars. You know, I happen to know a lot about the radar in that, in that cruiser. It can't even pick up bicycles. There's not enough metal in them. You're arguing evidence with Bob. You know what? You can win that argument. We can, win with the ar we can win the argument with unbelievers because we have great evidence. Evidence is a gift from God. But you're arguing evidence with Bob who's standing there in your uniform next to your cruiser. What's Bob going to say? Oh, you're right. There's no way you could have been speeding. Sorry about that. Have a nice day. Gets back in your cruiser and drives off. What's the problem? It's not your cruiser. It's not your uniform. It belongs to the government. And there's going to be an accounting. Monday morning, district chief shows up. Where's your cruiser? Well, Bob pulled me over in on Saturday, but I won the argument. Where's your cruiser? Brothers and sisters, that is neglect of duty. When we don't challenge the authority of the unbeliever, we're neglecting our duty. The unbeliever is standing there in our uniform, which isn't ours, next to our cruiser, which isn't ours, and we're going to argue evidence rather than challenge their authority. Let me ask you, where do you hear evidence in the secular world? In court, right? Who do you give evidence to in court? The judge and jury. When we give evidence for the existence of God to the unbeliever, who are we saying is the judge and jury? Them. And who's on trial? God. What does scripture say? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Oh, I'd never put God on trial. Really? Look at our church signs. Give God a chance. Try Jesus. Look at our t-shirts. Try Jesus. Look at our bumper stickers. Try Jesus. Who in scripture tried Jesus? Pontius Pilate. And if he didn't repent, he's in hell. Try Jesus? No. You don't try the king. You submit to him. We're putting God on trial and we're trying to give evidence to acquit him. You see, the unbeliever will argue evidence with you all day long because you're telling him that he's the judge over God. That's why I'm no longer an evidentialist. That's why I won't argue evidence for the truth of my position. You give up your authority and even if you win, the unbeliever is still the judge. You see, what we're doing is we're putting evidence on one side of the scale. The unbeliever is putting evidence on the other side of the scale, and the scales are going back and forth and back and forth. Finally, you put enough evidence on one side of the scale, and they say, yeah, you've convinced me with all this evidence. I want to become a Christian now. But then they watch a Richard Dawkins video. Puts evidence on the other side of the scale. Ooh, it's tipping the other way. Now. You know, I'm not so sure about this Christianity anymore. Who's holding the scale? The unbeliever. We're allowing them to be judge over God. You see, God can and has converted people with evidential apologetics. Maybe even some of you. God can strike a straight blow with a bent stick. But there may be a lot of people out there who think they're Christians who are still being the judge over God. You see, as Christians, we believe some things that without God, 
don't make a whole lot of sense. We believe that a man who was dead for three days came back to life, that a virgin gave birth, that a snake talked. Why do we believe that? On the authority of God's word. You see, if there's something we don't understand, we don't give up Christianity. We lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge him, and he will make our path straight. See, I don't understand everything in the Bible, but I trust God. See, you get people telling you that they used to be Christians. You can't reason out of Christianity if Jesus is Lord of your reasoning. See, there's a, a statistic that as many as 80% of college students who profess Christianity reject the faith after only one year in school. Do you know why they reject their faith? Because they were never Christians. If you reason out of Christianity, Christ was never Lord of your reasoning and you were never a Christian, just as it says in 1 John 2, 19, those who left us were never among us. When you are Lord of the evidence, you haven't submitted fully to Christ. You see, we all get the same evidence, but we examine the evidence according to what we already believe, according to the beliefs that we take to the evidence, the assumptions we have before we get to the evidence. What are they called? Before, pre, assumption, supposition. Presupposition. You knew we'd get there eventually. <laughs> Those are our presuppositions, and everyone has them. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about presuppositions. There's a man who thought he was dead. And this greatly distressed his family. You know, they thought, they can't have this guy around the house thinking he's dead. And they tried argument after argument after argument to convince him that he wasn't dead. Nothing worked. So they thought, oh, we'll take him to a medical doctor. A medical doctor will be able to convince him he's not dead. So they brought him to the medical doctor, and the medical doctor thought for a minute. He said, uh, tell me, do dead men bleed? And the guy thought for a minute. He said, well, their hearts aren't pumping, no, vein, no blood going through. Their no, no, dead men don't bleed. The doctor took out a pin, stuck him in the finger. Blood started coming out. The man looked down on his finger. He said, well, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. <laughs> he had a presupposition that he was dead. Nothing was going to change that. You attack their presuppositions. You see, I'm not an evidentialist. I don't give up my authority and argue evidence with the unbeliever. I'm a presuppositionalist. I challenge their presuppositions. See, my presupposition is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. I won't give up that presupposition, and I know it's true because God has revealed it to be true. See, if someone tells me that they can know things without God, I challenge that presupposition, and I show them that without God, you can't know anything. Now, I'll just give you a brief example of why that's the case. Of course, Scripture tells us that's the case. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But let's say I ask you something. If I ask you A, how do you know that this stand is here? Well, I see it. Well, how do you know your eyes are working properly? You go from A to B. I stand here, well, my eyes, that's B. How do I know my, my eyes are working properly? Because of C. My brain is telling me. How do you know your brain is working properly? Well, because of D. I went to the doctor and I did a test. Well, how do you know the doctor is telling you the truth? Well, because I saw the diploma on his wall. A, B, C, D, boom, boom, boom. You're going all the way down the line. You know where that stops? Nowhere. It's an infinite regress. It's, I know this because, this because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. It doesn't stop. You know, in order to know anything, you have to know everything. Or have revelation from somebody who does know everything. Who knows everything? God. Has he told us things so we can know it? Yes, he has. You see, we can know things. That makes sense in our worldview. It doesn't make sense in their worldview. I'm going to tell you another story about presuppositions. My good friend, Pastor Dustin Seegers, standing up at the back there, he's here with us. He was witnessing at a university campus when a philosophy student approached him. Now, Dustin, by the way, he can run circles around me with this argument. And he happens to be the best open-air preacher I've ever heard. And I don't think that's a, co that's a coincidence. But... Um, 
I'm going to ask Dustin actually to come up here afterwards and help me with the questions, and I hope that you have a lot of questions about this apologetic to help try and straighten it out, but I'm going to ask Dustin to come up here afterwards. Anyhow, this philosophy student came up to Dustin and wanted evidence for the resurrection. You know what Dustin said? You're a fool. You can't account for evidence. You need God for evidence, you fool. Repent. No, Dustin didn't say that. <laughs> Anybody who knows Dustin knows that Dustin wouldn't say that. He loves the people he talks to. That's why he's such a good open-air preacher. Other than the fact he's got a, a photographic memory too and loves the Lord. But he didn't say that to her. You know what Dustin did when this, this woman asked for evidence for the resurrection? He gave her evidence for the resurrection. Wait a minute. Didn't you just tell me that Dustin's a presuppositionalist and you're saying he gave her evidence? Was Dustin having a bad day or something? No. She wasn't challenging him. She wasn't challenging his beliefs. This was not an apologetic situation. She just wanted some evidence for the resurrection. If the person isn't challenging you, if all they want is some evidence, give it to them. But don't use it to put God on trial. But Sai, you said this was a story about presuppositions, and you're talking about evidence. Well, it is a story about presuppositions. You see, Dustin gave her evidence for the resurrection. Now, folks, if you haven't seen any of Dustin's video, I urge you to go to his YouTube channel and check it out. This instant, this exchange isn't on video, but you know, he's got some wonderful stuff on there. Anyhow, as I said, Dustin has a photographic memory, and he was giving her this evidence, that evidence, Roman guards, empty tombs, you know, female witnesses and stuff like that. Boom, boom, boom. And you know what? He convinced her that Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah. Right? You know what she said? And I'm not making this up. You can ask Dustin afterwards. You know what she said? Okay, you proved that Jesus rose from the dead, but you didn't prove that he's God. You know what Dustin said? You're right. I didn't. You see, this woman was a naturalist. Her presupposition was that nothing existed outside of the natural universe. You see, if you prove the resurrection to somebody with a pre-commitment to naturalism, what are they going to say? Wow, strange things happen in the world, and someday we're going to have a naturalistic explanation as to why this happened. In the meantime, send it to one of those supermarket tabloids. What do you say to a naturalist who denies the existence of God? Oh, uh, you don't believe in God? No. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that you do believe in God and you're without excuse for your sin against Him. Oh, that dusty old book written by Bronze Age, Bronze Age goat herders, you believe that? Every word of it. Every word of it. You don't believe that the Bible's true? No. But you do believe in truth, though, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have a standard of truth to call my Bible false. Uh, yeah, I believe in truth. What's truth without God? Now, I've been doing this a few years now, and you should hear some of the answers I get. Now, I'm not going to plug their podcast, but if you go to my multimedia page, there's a uh, debate that Dustin and I were involved in on October 15th last year about the 45-minute mark. Check that out if you want to hear a convoluted definition of truth. They don't know what truth is, and they're going to say our Bible's not true, and we let them. How do I know the Bible's true? Because God has revealed it to be true, and without Him, you couldn't even make sense of your question, because you can't account for truth. You see, we can define truth. Truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God. You can't get truth without God. If our thoughts are the mere byproducts of the chemical processes in our evolved brains, you don't get truth. You get brain barf. You see, Doug Wilson, he was talking about this experiment. He said, can you imagine if you took a bottle of Dr. Pepper and a bottle of Mountain Dew and you shook them up and you opened them up and they start to fizz? That would be the byproduct of a chemical reaction. 
Do you know what atheists say that our thoughts are? The byproduct of chemical reactions. If you did that experiment and shook up on you had one fizz and one f which of those fizzes would be true? You don't get truth from chemical reactions. For truth, you need God. This argument is good, by the way, for any objection to the Bible. You believe in Noah's Ark? What are you, nuts? What do most Christians do? Well, they're probably baby animals, and the ark was so many cubits, and they probably had this much food, and it'd be easy, you know, there are only so many kinds of animals at this time, it'd be easy to get them in the ark. What does the unbeliever say? Well, what about how they get here, what they do here, you know, where, how they get them there? On and on, you're arguing evidence with that person. Do you know what I do? Somebody says to me, you believe in Noah's Ark? I said, yes, I do. You don't believe it's true? No. You don't believe the Bible's true? No. Where do you get truth without God? See, you don't have to argue evidences with these people. Those evidences are for Christians. We can look in Genesis. We can find all that stuff to bolster our faith. But you don't argue truth with people who can't account for truth. Do you believe that a snake talk? Yes, I did, because my Bible tells me. I don't believe the Bible. You don't believe the Bible is true? No. Where do you get truth without God? They're using our worldview to argue against our worldview. Now, you might get someone out there who has a definition of truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. That's what they'll tell you. And you know what? That's fine. But if you don't appeal to God to tell you what's real, how do you know what's real? They're just moving the, goal, the goalposts. Mr. Unbeliever, how do you know what's real? My God, the invisible pink unicorn told me. I, had an, I actually had an atheistic PhD in philosophy, in, in philosophy tell me that his justification for truth was the invisible pink unicorn. And you know what I said to him? Guess what? You're no longer an atheist. I said, the first thing you have to do to defend your atheism is give up atheism. And you know, they're going to be reluctant to do that. He said, yeah, and, and you'll discard my God as quickly as I discard yours. I said, not at all. You book the hall, set up the debate. I'll argue for the God of Christianity as my foundation of truth. You argue for the invisible pink unicorn as your foundation. PhD in philosophy. Do you know what he said? As long as I can say I'm debating a parody, something made up. I said, if you're debating something made up, what's your foundation for truth? Never answered. Without God, you don't get truth. You'll hear people say, well, what about all those other gods? Why can't it be one of them? You see, Mr. Christian, you don't believe in any of those other gods. You're atheistic towards all of them. I just believe in one less God than you do. Don't give up biblical authority. Psalm 96 verse 5. All the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You see, technically, people who believe in other gods are not theists. They're idolaters. I don't deny other gods. There are no other gods. I deny idols. 1 Kings 8.60, the Lord is God and there are no others. If you believe in other gods and reject the God of the Bible, you're not a theist. According to the Bible, you're an idolater and a fool. Wouldn't it be nice if Scripture gave us some indication how we should deal with fools? Wouldn't that be great? Too bad Scripture doesn't do that, eh? Proverbs 26.4 do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. What's the fool's folly? That there is no God and that they can reason without him. What do we do? We give evidence to the unbelievers so that they can use their own reasoning to get to God. We do exactly what Scripture tells us not to do. Brothers and sisters, if you get on the unbeliever's airplane, you're going to the unbeliever's destination. If you say that they can reason without God, then even if you persuade them to say that God exists, they could turn around and say, well, I didn't need God to get there. I got there with my own reasoning. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Romans eleven thirty six. 36. 
your reasoning, my reasoning, your ability to know anything. You don't believe in God? How can you know anything without God? Brothers and sisters, it's that simple. You don't believe in God? How do you know anything? How do you know? I can teach you this in four simple words. How do you know without God? You see, Mr. Unbeliever, my worldview says that God reveals some things to us such that we can be certain of them. That would be possible, right? I mean, God's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He could do that, right? Yeah, sure. If God, could, if God existed, he could do that. He could do that in a book, right? Well, sure, he's God. God can reveal things. So, you could, yeah, he could do that. Okay, so according to my worldview, I can know things for certain. How do you know anything for certain to be true? Um, I use my senses, my memory, and my reasoning. Is everyone's senses, memory, and reasoning valid? No. How do you know that yours are? Uh, I use my senses, my memory, and my reasoning to tell me that my senses, my memory, and reasoning are valid. You don't see the problem there, Mr. Unbeliever? You see, if you can't appeal to God who made you and who made reasoning possible, then you can't get knowledge. You get viciously circular nonsense. You get what the world calls knowledge. You get false knowledge that's not grounded in Christ. False knowledge. False knowledge. Where have I heard? False knowledge. Hmm. 1 Timothy 6.20. Timothy, guard, has what, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Colossians 2 verse 8. Verse, verse eight See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. The problem is not new, brothers and sisters. Don't give up biblical authority. Paul warned us about it. And it's exactly what we're doing. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Since you reject Christ, how do you know anything? How do you know? How do you know? Come on, you're arguing like a two-year-old, Mr. Christian. Yeah, and you can't defeat the argument of a two-year-old. Okay, I can't know anything, but either can you. You know how many intelligent or seemingly intelligent people have said that to me? I can't know anything, but either can you. Do you know what I say? If you can't know anything, how can you know what I can know? <laughs> they deny knowledge, and the first thing out of their mouth is a knowledge claim. Besides, you just told me that according to my worldview, I can know things. Eric Hovind, who's also been in and out here doing some filming, he's here tonight. He was explaining this to his daughter Stephanie when she was seven years old. He said, you know, honey, there's people out there who say they can't know anything. You know what Stephanie said? How do they know that? Seven years old. See, kids get this. They haven't been duped by the world yet like most of us have. You see, you don't have to give up your authority. Show them that they can't know anything without God and show them that they can't live that way. Brothers and sisters, these people are denying that air exists, breathing it all the while. They're using what God has given them to deny God. You see, unbelievers do know things. You have to be able to know things to live, but they're suppressing the truth about their only possible justification for knowledge, the God that they know exists. Expose to them that they're living in God's world, that they're doing things that they cannot do without God, and that they need to repent for their sin and suppression of the truth. They're not giving God the glory for their ability to think, to know, to talk, to eat, to see, to smell, to breed, to breathe, to reason. Reason rally? Are you kidding me? Challenge their ability to reason and show them that without God, 
they have no reason. Tell them the reason they can't answer your questions is because they're not saved. That's right. Jesus didn't only die to save souls for eternity. He died to save reasoning now. Show them that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ and that without him, they can't justify anything they claim to know. You see, the goal of apologetics is not to convert people. We can't convert even one person. The goal of apologetics is to lovingly close their mouths in the hope that the Holy Spirit works in their hearts when they have nothing more to say. You can't make them see the truth. But you can expose the foolishness of the rejection of it and call them to repentance and share the gospel with them. Now, there's a danger in this apologetic because when you speak the truth, you're going to win arguments. That's why I'm very reluctant to teach this to jerks. You see, when you've been beat down using bad apologetics your entire life, you may want to return the favor. But we're commanded to do this with gentleness and respect. You see, there's also a tendency for pride when you start winning arguments. And you will win arguments. But never forget that we're unworthy servants only doing our duty. All the glory goes to God. Never forget that. You see, winning arguments is not our goal, but it is the consequence of speaking truth. Keep in mind that the only difference between you and the person you're talking to is the grace of God. Open-air preaching is to show the love of Christ. It isn't to scold people. Brothers and sisters, the war has been won. Jesus Christ is king. We don't have to be prideful or argumentative with people. Yes, we must argue, but not be argumentative. There is a difference. That's your father out there, your sister, your daughter, your brother, your uncle. Have arguments with them, kind, loving arguments, but do it with gentleness and respect. Don't scold them. You see, there's no script in this. Just know that they know that God exists and that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Don't give up your authority and tomorrow you can go out there with every authority professing the name of Jesus Christ as King. And you know something? That was the end of my sermon. Until I read it to a couple of friends of mine. You know what they said? Sai, you demolished the evidential approach of defending the faith. But you didn't really tell them what to say. You have to address that. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to address it. If you're out there thinking, Sai, please tell us what to say. Here's my answer. No. See, I have given some examples, and I hope in the Q&A to give more examples. But this is not about what you say. It's about who God is. I don't want this to be a four-point methodology. What did Sai say here? What did he say here? Oh, what did he say? You know, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of what I used to do. And this has been changing in my life, too. Somebody says to me, I can't believe the Bible. There's too many contradictions in the Bible. I can't believe it. I say, oh, you have a problem with contradictions? Why can't you have contradictions in your worldview? Well, contradictions aren't logical. I say, well, look at logic. Logic is not made of matter, it's universal, and it does not change. God is not made of matter, he's universal, and he does not change. You can't get logic in your worldview. And do you know what I get? I get people right out here writing, okay, universal. Okay, uh, logic is, is immaterial, and, uh, and, and it doesn't change. It's not about what you say to the person. Just know who God is. It doesn't matter what you say. Don't say things that are inconsistent with Scripture. When scripture says that they know that God exists, believe it. It doesn't matter what you say. Now, we're going to talk about certain scenarios to show you how that looks in the Q&A, but it's not about a methodology. It's not about step one, step two, step three. It's about who God is. And if you know that, then you can go out tomorrow and profess your faith and discuss with people with every confidence. You see, all of us are commanded to do this. Everybody, from the university professor to the lowest intellect that you can imagine. We're commanded to do this. And if you challenge in the biz biblical way, it's easy. You know, four years ago, I was working in a factory. I don't have a PhD in this or that. You know, I'm you guys out there. 
This is easy. I've debated PhDs in philosophy in their blog, and they talk about the invisible pink unicorn. This is easy if you do it right, if you do it biblically. Just know what the Bible says, believe it, and do it. So I want to thank you for the time that you've had here, and I'm going to call Dustin up here, and we're going to answer some questions, if that's all right. I don't know if you want to stretch your legs for about five minutes, and you want to have a Q&A after that. Thanks very much. Well, let's, let's close in prayer, actually. Sorry. I don't know if anybody's coming up here. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity, Lord God. You know that I can't make them see the truth. Lord God, I know that you revealed stuff to us. Please move in us, Lord God, through your spirit so that we may see the truth, know the truth, accept the truth, and live the truth, O Lord God, most high. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and for the opportunity to serve you. I pray this in Jesus' most precious name.